Welcome to the Birth Journeys Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Hoff, BSN RN. I am a wife, a mother of two, and a nurse specializing in the care of women and newborns. In this podcast, we will share powerful journeys of birth givers with the goals of lifting the veil on the birth experience, healing through sharing, and beginning an open conversation to strengthen trust and promote transparency between birthing people and healthcare providers. Hello, today I have with me Micah Burgess. Micah is the mother of six. She is a doula in Waco, Texas, and she is the host of the podcast, My Doula Micah. Today, she is here to talk about teamwork in the delivery room. Micah, hello. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, lady. Happy to. I'm go. so excited. We have talked about this collaboration for a while. and I know. It's fucking happening. I'm so excited. We have a common goal, and that is working together in the delivery room because we want moms to succeed at this birthing process, however it looks. But that requires a lot of teamwork and a lot of coming to the same page between the nurse, the hospital, the doula, the mother, the family member, all of those people need to come together and set aside all of their stuff and work together to help the mom on this goal of birthing a child. So because you're a doula that comes in and helps guide what that support might look like, I'd love for you to elaborate on what the role of a doula is, because I don't think a lot of people know. Right. I think people have assumptions. But they don't know. And also, I mean, Kelly, you may not know this, but when a lot of people still think that a doula and a midwife are the same thing, they don't know the difference. And so a midwife actually delivers your baby if you hire a midwife, they would replace your obstetrician. But a doula is simply a childbirth labor coach. Literally means servant. I don't do anything medical. I'm not going to deliver your baby. I don't want to deliver your baby. I have a job. And when people hire, like a modern day doula would be someone that helps prepare a family prenatally about maybe what to expect. Typically, my main clientele would be women that are wanting to have a more natural childbirth experience. And, and so we go over a lot of what that looks like and what that means. A lot of people think that doulas only support home births or birthing centers. And that's not true. I literally built a thriving career here in Waco, Texas. And my specialty was natural hospital births. And it's very rewarding, very rewarding. And I think that there's a lot of different kinds of doulas, if I was going to be honest, which I didn't realize until I really got on Facebook and started getting to know other doulas and other Facebook groups. And so the approach is different. The thoughts are different. Some doulas really only want to go to home births or birthing centers. They're, they're not comfortable supporting a woman in the hospital. And then, then there are some doulas that are very adamant about having your baby a certain way, that there's a, a right way to do it. And I think what I have found not only just in my career, but also as a mom of six, that at the end of the day, birth is birth. Yes, I have a goal maybe going in, a birth plan. I want a birth experience a certain way, and that's great. But what I'm really learning is that having a positive birth experience is the most important thing. And I early in my career realized I'm going to leave my agenda as a doula at the door. This isn't about me. This is about the laboring mama and what kind of experience she wants and needs at the end of the day. And there's a huge difference in delivering at home and delivering at the hospital. There's a really big difference. And I think it's important for a family to understand the difference. And I think it's important for a doula to understand the difference. So I talk a lot about that on, on my podcast. Yes. And I listened to that and I love it. <laughs> and I loved your book, by the oh, way, too. We're going to, let's go ahead and plug your book. Yes. I was rolling, <laughs> like rolling with laughter. Good. So I really, I love that you're talking about putting the agenda at the door and really working together yeah. because the hospital has policies that they abide right. by. A hospital birth is going to look a little bit more medical, or if it's not medical, it's going to, we're going to offer you things that are medical that are put in place to ensure safety is available in the context that the hospital understands safety, which is the medical context. Yep. So things like an IV 
port will probably be put in. You don't have to be hooked up right. to it. You may be offered fluids or sure. medications through that IV, which can be declined if it is not medically necessary. There's additionally some other things that may be perceived as inconvenient, such as being hooked up to a monitor for certain periods of time so that we can ensure in our medical way sure. the safety of the baby based on medical studies that are considered evidence-based practice, mm -hmm. right? And I'm saying it in that way because we don't really do studies on natural birth. Right. We don't do randomized controlled trials on right. women laboring naturally, yeah. right? So the only thing that we know as a medical community is the way that the medical community has set things up. Of course. And women have birthed babies for the since the beginning of time. Yes. Some successfully, some not so successfully. Right. And the goal of the medical community is to use science in the way that we understand it and have studied it in order to improve outcomes. Yep. And sometimes we're successful. <laughs> and and yes, the goal for the medical community is for there to be a safe delivery for both baby and mom. All of that came about. I mean, honestly, there's been doulas way before there were doctors. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> because I mean, when a woman went into labor before there were hospitals and doctors, I mean, it was her friends and her neighbors that showed up exactly to help her. Yeah. Okay. So it, this is the, the idea of having a support person in the room, somebody that's going to help you Physically, let's find a good position. Mentally, hey, you're doing so good. This next contraction, let's breathe through it together. Emotionally, I know you're so tired and you're ready for this to be over. Come here, girl, let me give you a hug. I mean, that is essentially what I do in a lot of respects. And because that element has been removed once the medical aspects, hospitals, OBs came into play. And I think well, one of the things I really try to do with my clients is educate them on especially what the role is of a labor and delivery nurse. Most people don't understand yeah. their job and what their role is. And they're surprised that the nurse wasn't hanging out with them for hours. And I'm like, well, first of all, the, the amount, you can't even imagine all of the paperwork, all of the things they're required to do. They have to, they, they have to fill out all mm -hmm. of those things. And trust me, none of them want to. They would much prefer at all. to hang out with you. Okay. I have lots of friends now that are L&D nurses and they'll come in and they're like, okay, I'm hiding out in here for a while. And they literally sit down and prop up their feet and we talk and my clients are involved in the conversation. It's super laid back. I mean, that they would love for every birth to look that way, but it that's just not possible. They have more than one patient, more than likely that they are taken care of. They answer to like three different entities. They answer to, first of all, they are the upholders of hospital policy. That's not even really the doctor's right. job. That is the labor and delivery nurse's job. She also mm -hmm. answers to the OB. The OB decides what's going to happen, what kind of cares. The nurse updates the OB. So the nurse is answering to them and answers to the patient. That's a lot. That's, that's a lot of hats to be juggling. And so I just don't think people fully understand that role. And so, in my opinion, that's where it's really great to have a doula there. If you're wanting somebody that has been to birth before, that is going to try to help you accomplish maybe a more natural childbirth experience, you're mostly what women are looking for. They, they want to be calm. They want to feel in control. They want to know how to attack this contraction and how to breathe properly. They'd like to find the best position so that they're comfortable, but it's still working well for them to have consistent, hard contractions. They, they want somebody to remind them that they're giving birth and not dying. They want somebody to maybe advise them on, okay, we could go this route or this route. What's the plan here? What's the great advice? And so I really want my clients to understand all the ins and outs of that. And I prepare them for the things that they will be faced with, the decisions that they're going to be making up front so that they're not surprised when the labor and delivery nurse comes in and says, hey, we have not gotten a good read on baby with the monitors for about an hour now. And it's mostly just because you're up and about moving around. Hey, let's find a position where you're comfortable and I can still be hearing baby. We're getting closer and closer to delivery. And we want to make sure baby's still doing well. And the truth is, the baby's heart rate is the best indicator if everything is okay or not. It just, 
that's yeah. your best indicator because we can't look inside there and really see. And so what should happen, what I want to see happen and what I've worked really hard in my community to have happen is I want to work with that L&D nurse. Great. Yes, let's do it. Let's find a good position. I will literally hold that monitor in place if you want me to so that you can walk out of the room and know we're going to get a good read on baby. I want you to be able to get that. This is a benefit to my client and to your patient when you and I are collaborating on the best way for you to get your job done. Listen, Kelly, I want you to do your job well. I want (laughs) you to do your job well. And what I have found is that when I let you do your job well, you let me do my job well. And what I have been trained in is natural childbirth and comfort measures. And here's how we breathe through that. And that's what I have been trained in. And so when you see that I am not standing in your way on doing your job, then you don't stand in my way in doing my job. And what I have found is we don't run into each other. We don't trip over each other. We're helping each other. There's not tension in the room. We're not combating. There is actually nothing to be fighting about. Anyway, you can tell I'm passionate about this topic. <laughs> I know you are. And so am I. You're just voicing all of my my thoughts and feelings. I just think that it's a beautiful dance when a labor and delivery nurse and a doula can work together. And I love those experiences. 100%. And I love that experience with the mother. And, you know, I honestly, because I can't be in there every second of the birthing process, I need someone yeah. there that is going to help that mother get through it. Otherwise, it's all kind of on her. Mm-hmm. I can I can put someone in a position that's comfortable for the moment. Yeah. But because you need to maintain a dynamic pelvis, sometimes, you know, you need someone that's there constantly in order to make that happen. And I can try to teach the other support person what to do. But, you know, everybody's kind of just learning. Right when this is all happening. So to have somebody there that understands all those comfort techniques that can change the atmosphere of the room to something that's calm, whether it's with the the essential oils or the fairy lights or, you know, I love coming into the rooms that are just like have this vibe, right? I also love someone that's there helping to reposition the patient when it's appropriate. Yeah. And like you said, it is important to get those data points, which is for mothers in labor, at least in the early stages of labor, for the most part, that's a 20 minute segment of what we call a reactive strip, which is moderate variability. And we'd we'd love to have two accelerations in that baby's heart rate. So we want to see a nice wiggly heart rate and like some, some jumps that tell us that that baby's neurological system is intact. And still that the baby is just, you know, rocking through this labor. And that's all we want. That's all I care about. Right. Is to be able to put that data point in the computer so that everybody is reassured that everything is going well. Yeah. And then honestly, sometimes the data point of having how we have progressed is somewhat helpful. Yeah. However, yep. most of the time moms can tell us that. <laughs> Once we get to that point where there's so much pressure right. yeah. that we know a baby's gonna come out. Yep. You know, exactly. as long as the baby's safe, does it really matter? Right. <laughs> like it's going to come out at some point. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, you know, again, because I don't do anything medical, honestly, I'm glad it really does free me up to do my job. I am not yeah. watching the monitor. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I don't have to. You are. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't have to do that. Thank goodness. You know, and so. I'm I'm glad because it really doesn't enable me to do what I am there to do. And what I really want is when a laboring mom is calm and is successfully breathing through her contractions beautifully, she's not traumatized, she's not scared, she's progressing well, that benefits everybody. I mean, that's one yeah. of the first things that I mean, one of the OBs that I worked with here in town, he was like, hey, Micah, what you're doing for women makes my job easier. And so that's exactly what I want. I want to bridge the gap yes, for my client between me and the medical team, because I want my client to know, hey, we are all team Sarah. Everyone in this room wants you to have a positive birth experience. And I remember this one OB telling me we were having a conversation. I had gone to his clinic one day so we could actually have a conversation. It's hard to have a conversation with an OB in the labor and delivery room. He's yeah. Right. And so he and I were having a conversation in his clinic and he was like, listen, I don't care how she wants to have her baby. 
I'm not trying to mess with her birth. I don't care how she wants to do it. I just want to make sure that I'm being able to check the boxes and that I'm overseeing and watching because what I learned is that if if the you know emergency door is at a 10, like we're knocking on the door of we got to get this bomb into a C-section right now or we're going to lose baby, uh, nobody, including me, we don't want to get anywhere near that door. We're not, I don't want to get to a 10. And so typically an OB, maybe if we're getting to a three or a five, is going to start talking and mentioning, hey, I'm noticing something or I'm concerned potentially about something. An OB might be communicating some thoughts, some concerns, some wishes to be considering. And I think they communicate that in plenty of time to help maybe the mom get adjusted to the fact that maybe we might have to do an intervention here. And so we want to have that conversation sooner rather than later. So what I learned is, okay, they're not saying you're done, but the panic, I think oftentimes with a mom or even a doula, because it was even brought up, have this feeling that, wait, you're trying to stop me from getting what I want. Mm -hmm. And that what I have found is that that's actually not what's happening. Right. It's it's a conversation. And so I've learned how to put some strategies in place in the birthing room so that there can be a conversation mm-hmm. so that I can hear what he's trying to say, what he's concerned about. And so I teach my clients how to ask good questions. Oh, wow. Okay. You're concerned about that. So wait, are we in an emergency situation right now? And he's like, No. No, there's not an emergency. Okay, great, good. What happens if we don't do what you're saying right now? Well, nothing's gonna like happen if you don't do it. I just want us to be thinking along those lines. Okay, great, perfect. Thank you for telling us that. We don't wanna get to that point either. Are we cool to still keep doing what we're doing? Yeah, y'all can do it as long as mom and baby are fine. Y'all can do this as long as you want. Perfect. So those questions... And that cooperation, acknowledging what's been said, agreeing we don't want to be an emergency, that communicates to the medical staff, I'm not trying to knock on emergency door either. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ignore if there needs to be a medical intervention. And I'm not leading my client in that way either. So then that brings a relief and a reassurance to the medical staff that I'm not there trying to mess with their job. Right. They're not trying to mess with my client's birth. They're happy with me doing what I'm doing. So now we're establishing this trust. Now, the next time I come in, I'm trusted a lot more Mm -hmm. than after I've been there for a year and they know I'm not cutting the knees off Mm -hmm. (laughs) of of these OBs and say, don't do what your doctor says. I mean, I am not the medical provider. I'm actually not going to say that. I am going to give my client all of the options. Yeah, I am going to let them know what all their options are so that we can have that discussion. But I'm not there to try to change hospital policy. I think if you're a doula and that is what you're trying to do, you're in the wrong line of work. There is a spot for you somewhere if that's what you're passionate about. But at the end of the day, it's not helping the client that you're working with right now. Yeah. If your goal is to try to change hospital policy. Are there some things that need to be changed? I probably yeah, yeah. As, as a person who's more natural childbirth friendly, yeah, I would love to see some things updated or changed yep. for sure. But that's not why this mama hired me. Right. Are you pregnant and planning a hospital birth? You don't need a birth plan. You need a birth vision. In my opinion, birth plans set you up for failure. Yep, I said it. Hear me out before you turn off this podcast. You may think that by downloading a generic birth plan, it means you're in control. The truth is it's not that simple. No one can control exactly how their birth will go. There are way too many variables. What every pregnant person wants is to walk into the hospital pregnant and to walk out with a healthy newborn in their arms. The journey in between is the murky part. It's hard to know what issues might come up that need to be addressed. If you focus your energy on a birth vision rather than giving your power to a birth plan, you can empower yourself to make the best choices for you and your baby. That's why you need to get into my Empowered Hospital Birth Program. As a labor nurse and mindset coach, I can help guide you through the process of maintaining the calm autonomy that will help you achieve the birth vision you desire. In my Empowered Hospital Birth Program, 
I will help you identify the source of anxiety you have surrounding hospital birth. Fill in knowledge gaps to make sure that you are fully informed and confident. Learn key phrases so you can better communicate with your medical team. Emotionally process your fears so that they don't hold power over you. Go to kellyhoff.com backslash empowered to book a free 30-minute private birth vision call where we will identify your top fears and must-haves and gain clarity on exactly how you want to feel in the birth space. That's K-E-L-L-Y-H-O-F dot com backslash empowered. I'm honored to be a part of your birth journey. Yeah, and there's my... I, I work at a couple different hospitals and I, I have worked at other hospitals and I've noticed that the policies are slightly different at every single one. And there are things that I wish that I could do at certain hospitals, but it just doesn't work with the workflow. And yeah. the thing that I have come to understand is that nothing stays the same. So yeah. if I don't like something, I just kind of decide I'm going to wait a minute, might mention it. I might yeah. mention it a couple more times. I might just keep talking about it. And eventually I found Especially if it's something that is evidence-based practice or if it's something that is being researched, they're starting to compile good data on it, Mm -hmm. I might start mentioning it. But it does take a while for things to change in a medical setting because you have to have a lot of good data. There's not a whole lot of experimentation that happens at the bedside. Right, right. So if you have... a tiny little research trial in one area of the world that's a small population. And there is data that suggests that one of these interventions might have an outcome that you are not interested. I'm not even going to say bad outcome, because bad for, uh, for one person may be fine for the other. If that's what we're looking at, probably in the hospital, it's not going to be something that is going to be a policy, right? We're going to go with the bigger trials, all the information compiled together. It may not be that way forever, but, you know, that's how it is for right now. There are things you can decline certain things. Right. And depending on what that thing is that you're declining, you're either going to get very little pushback or you may get a lot of pushback. Right. And and it has to a lot to do with, without mentioning certain specific interventions, it has a lot to do with again, how much data is involved. So I think it's really important to have that conversation when we walk in. Because if I am admitting a patient, and I'm lucky enough to have the doula there when I'm admitting the patient, because oh my goodness, (laughs) we can all talk at that beginning of time and not necessarily later on, you know, when we're five centimeters and really working through things. I love to have that conversation ahead of time. Because then for instance, if somebody says, oh, I don't, want vitamin K because there was this study of 200 people in Switzerland that had later in life at age 40, all the babies that had vitamin K had cancer. Let's have a conversation about that one trial, because I like to talk about babies that didn't have vitamin K in Tennessee had a huge incidence of brain bleeds in a six month period when there was this trend of declining the vitamin K. And it's Mm -hmm. all, I feel like in this world, (laughs) there are no facts. (laughs) Like, what is a fact, actually? Everything's fluid. It's evidence. You may present the evidence to me, and I may present the evidence to you. And I'm going to talk about my concerns, and you're going to talk about your concerns. And if the hospital policy says something, for instance, that I have to have a waiver for you to decline this medication, boy, I'd really prefer to do it at the beginning. So, for instance, back to vitamin K, because it is a medication that is recommended at most hospitals by most NICUs or special care nurseries right. or whatever you have at the hospital, you're going to probably need to decline in writing and also may need to have a conversation with the neonatal provider, you know, because we have to have that medication in within an hour. It's so much better when you do that before you give birth rather than, you know, waiting and having that conversation later. Now, if you come in and you're 10 centimeters, right, sure. Sure. <laughs> we're not going to have that conversation right now. But I've had that conversation, unfortunately, even though, even though I've had full conversations and read somebody's birth plan, I have had situations where I am hanging blood on a mom who is passing out. And the last thing she says to me before passing out is I am declining the vitamin K. And I'm like, whoa, that's not what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So, Um, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's hard because we come from a place where we've seen those kinds of things and it's triggering as providers. 
And so we really, really try to, we try to work with you and we try to work with your desires because I want you to have, I want you to have the beautiful, perfect birth that you want. But that involves having a healthy mom and a healthy baby. I really don't think anybody comes in desiring the birth process to be better than the birth outcome. I think many, many, many women would like for the birth process to be just as successful as the outcome, which is a healthy baby, right? Yeah. And we really, you know, we're women. I would want what I want. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And so I get that. <laughs> I get that. And so let's shoot for that. Why not? Let's let's try to check all the boxes. You know, I'm certainly not opposed to that. I want you to have the experience that you want to have. I will say this I, as a doula, you know, a lot of my training, I, I did go to a lot of home births, mm -hmm. but my career was primarily in the hospital. I really felt like that ended up being my calling. Women really need help. If you're wanting to have a natural birth in a hospital, that's hard. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a totally different bird than if you're at home. And my approach as a doula is completely different mm -hmm. at a home birth than at a, than at a hospital. And so I guess what I would say is, you know, a lot of my clients who are having their babies in a hospital, they want a more natural experience. And the plan is to deny just about everything. And it's not even that the L&D nurse kept bugging them about it. It's that because of the challenges, because of the things we're working around, because I've been stuck in a hospital room for 18 hours, yeah. I'm done, yo. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that is totally fine. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like a huge part of my job as well is to, I, I want to empower my clients that their choice, no matter what their choice is, is their power to choose. It is. Their power to choose after 24 hours, stuck at four centimeters, no sleep and no food, to go ahead and have the epidural, I'm going to celebrate her choice and say, heck yeah, yeah. you need to sleep because you're still going to push a baby out. Mm -hmm. Let's avoid a C-section. I think this is the right move. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So what happens at the, you know, baby's here and now she feels good about her choice and not guilty about her choice. That's helping nobody, y'all. Right. That's helping nobody to make a mom feel guilty or not encourage her to embrace the choice that she made. Mm -hmm. It's fine. It's okay. It can be good, you know? And I am personally not one of these people that, hey, as soon as you walk in the door, hit me up with the epidural and Everything seems to be going fine. I don't want people to do that. Me I mean, either. that's a strong medication. It is. Put the needle in your back. I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, let's let's think about that a little bit longer. That just happens to be my bent. That just happens to be my preference and what I think works. But that doesn't mean if a mom ends up getting an epidural who originally wanted to go all natural, doesn't mean she failed. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean she's not strong. It just doesn't mean any of that. Mm -hmm. And so I really want my clients at the end of the day to always feel like when they look back at their birth, I'm so thankful for my birth. It was hard as hell. Yes. No doubt about it. I can't make that part go away, y'all. Mm -hmm. I'm not a magician. It's right. going to be hard. It's going to be hard. But it, it can be inspiring and monumental and good. It can be a good, positive experience, even though it was hard. And even if you went with plan B. Yes. And sometimes you guys, plan B is better than plan A. Yeah. That would be my encouragement to any doulas that are listening right now. Yes, we have an idea and we know what our training is and we want to help promote a more natural experience. Yay. Yes. And amen. All for all of that. But at the end of the day, when you look at this mama and she is absolutely 100% mentally, emotionally done. Her body's gone through the ringer. Is your choice going to be what you think is best or is your choice going to be to support her and now what she needs yeah. to get through the birth? Mm -hmm. What is your choice going to be? And I would say that the birthing experience, it goes with a mom for a very long time, forever, yeah. actually. And even if everything didn't go exactly the way she wanted it to, we still want every woman to look back and go, yeah, but you know what? It was good. Yeah. I don't, I don't regret this or that. Now, if you're someone who has not been informed 
and you feel like you walked in and you didn't know all the things that you feel like you should have known and you would have chosen differently. Okay. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe you felt that way. Maybe there is a doctor in your area that is known for high C-section rates and, and kind of bullies his way through. Okay. Maybe you do have one of those, but I'm just saying in my experience, that's not the standard care. That's not the standard. There is protocol and what is just, hey, this is how we normally practice things. And unless you are someone coming in saying, actually, I'd like to do it a little bit different, then you're going to get standard procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That is so true. And then I think that kind of piggybacking on that, the trauma comes from when you feel like you failed because you chose plan Mm -hmm. B. Right. So it's not that you went with plan B. It's because you feel like that's a failure. And right. then your brain does things to cu- to make it feel like a trauma. And yep. I just don't think it's necessary. And, you know, I may have my own opinions about what interventions would be best for the mom. Sure. I don't feel like I have an agenda. But mm-hmm. when I feel like something that we're offering is going to improve the outcome Mm-hmm. I I feel like I start to have some feelings there because I want a healthy mom and a healthy baby too. Yep. And what is frustrating is when I perceive that the pushback is coming from the fact that because this was my plan, I don't want to do that. And right. I I have a hard time sometimes impressing on people that that wasn't my first choice either. Yeah. But here we are. And so right. how are we going to deal with the current situation? Do we want to right. continue the way we had planned or do we want to maybe modify that plan a little bit to possibly ensure a better outcome? Yep. And I'm not sure how you, Kelly, personally proceed or, or what your hospital, the ones that you work with, how y'all proceed in this. But some of my favorite nurses, when it looks like things are about to shift and that the, the patient is not going to end up following the birth plan to the letter of the law, okay? Mm-hmm. And that it looks like there might need to be an intervention in some way, shape, or form. Some of the best nurses, and 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 again, if you're an L&D nurse and you're listening to me, I'm going to suggest that when you have the conversation, remember, this is a a woman that is having the one of the most monumental experiences she'll ever have in her entire life. And she wants it to be perfect. Yeah. She wants it to go the way she wants it to go. And so when a labor and delivery nurse acknowledges, hey, listen, Sarah, I know what you wanted was this, this, and this. And you have done such a good job to try to achieve that. I am so impressed by you. And man, if this over here wasn't happening, you would absolutely be able to have what you want. I want you to have that. But I care about you. I care about your baby. I want you to hear a couple things that I want, that I'm going to say. Here's a couple options. And let's talk about these. Ask me the questions that you want to ask me. Tell me what your concerns are, but I'm only bringing it up because I think it might be what's best for you and baby. I want you to get what you want. Trust me. And I think when a labor and delivery nurse now relates to that mama Mm -hmm. and communicates I know how badly you wanted this. I want it too. However, we let's have an adult conversation. Let me let me share with you some thoughts and give me the pushback. Give me the concerns. Tell me what you're thinking. Let's get to this decision together, right? Now she feels like and knows you are on her team. You are for her. And as a doula, when that conversation comes up, I'm like, yes, Kelly, tell us what are the options? What are the concerns? And then it it definitely relieves that mama and feeling like she's going to have to fight for something. No, no, no. We're just going to have a conversation about these options. And I have found more times than not that once that conversation has been had, the mom will tend to, man, it's not 100%. I'm sure it's not, but it is a very high percentage. She will say, yeah that does make a lot of sense. And I want what's best for me and baby. I'm not willing to take that risk that you're talking about. And let's move forward because we can still work with that. This isn't the end of the day. Mm -hmm. This doesn't break everything. I can still have what I want in this birthing experience. 
inviting and, and initiating something that maybe I wasn't thinking before. You know, women are relational. Yeah. They want to talk. They want to listen. Yeah. I feel like too, where as a human being, which I will acknowledge yep. that I am, <laughs> <laughs> and that I have feelings, I feel like when I walk into a room and I feel like there's a vibe that's kind of closed and mm-hmm. decisions have already been made and yeah. we're going to be defensive, there are times that I have a hard time kind of getting through. Yeah. I've been successful before, but you know, as everybody is different, it sometimes is challenging for me. Yeah. What what are some of your suggestions when you have an environment where you walk in and the, the air is just thick with defensiveness? Yeah, and that's something I really try I, I mean, I try to avoid. Yeah. I mean, the very thing I do when I walk into the birthing room is especially if it's under, it's been a long time <laughs> since, since I, I was a new doula in a, in a place. I mean, I'm very well known in my community. Yeah. Every, everybody knows who I am. And just so you all know the result of what I'm about to encourage you guys to do. The result of that has been when I walk in, I am greeted by the L and D nurse. Hey, I'm so glad you're here. Here's what's happening. Here's where she's at. What do you want to do, Micah? What are your thoughts? That's what it's given me. That's what it's given to my clients. That is the benefit. Mm-hmm. I'm being asked, what do you what do you think? What do you want to do? They pretty much let my client and I do our thing. And as long as baby looks good, they don't really care what we do. Right. Because they know I'm not trying to jeopardize care. Yeah. They know that I'm not doing that. And so coincidentally, my client pretty much gets what she wants yeah. because there's no, listen, stress and tension. That is not going to help your client. Mm -hmm. That is counterproductive in labor. Mm -hmm. It's not a good fit. So as a new doula or as someone who is trying to establish themselves, trying to, you know, work together and establish this teamwork. First thing I do is introduce myself to the L and D nurse. I am not going to dodge her. I want there to be communication right up front. Hey, Callie, I'm Micah. It is so great to be working with you. How's she doing? What do you th- what do you think? Are we on track? How's baby look? I want you to know that I welcome the conversation. We need to be a part of this process together. And I teach my clients how to ask the questions themselves because at the end of the day, they are the patient. They are the only ones that can choose for themselves. It has to come from them. If if they're married and their spouse is in there and their husband has an opinion and a thought, it actually doesn't even matter what he says. He's not the patient. Right. It has to come from the patient. So we've got to teach women how to communicate and how to effectively ask questions so that there can be a conversation. So I think that's personally what works best. And I think that if there is a room that is thick with tension, then as a, as a medical provider, then you try to have that conversation, introduce yourself. Hey, I'm so glad that you're here. Let me know if there's anything that you guys need. Mama looks great. I feel really positive about her being able to achieve her goals. Let me know what I can do. Help set that tone right away. Even though it feels thick with tension, you'll be surprised how that can help bring it down. Um, one really small thing that I would do is I didn't ever buzz for a nurse unless there was an emergency. <laughs> Look, I got legs. <laughs> I just walk myself out there to the nurse's station and say, hey, when you get a chance, no big rush. We're looking for a couple of extra pillows. Mm-hmm. Or she's out of ice and water. Is that something I can grab? Mm-hmm. You know, hey, whenever you get a chance, I think she's, you know, she's needing to go to the restroom. I mean, now they trust me enough to unplug her. And walk to the bathroom with her and plug her back up. Mm-hmm. I mean, now they trust me to do that. But before I would communicate, hey, she's gonna run to the restroom real quick. Are y'all cool if I unplug her real quick and then we'll get we'll get back where we need to be? Mm-hmm. Just talk, just yeah. communicate, you know. And same thing for the LD nurse. Hey, let us know whatever she's thinking. I, I think volunteering things up front that maybe they think they might have to fight for would be super helpful. Yeah. Hey. If you want to get in the shower, let me know. I'll wrap up that IV port and the water is an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. Wait, what? You just suggested a shower right at the beginning? That's awesome. It lets them know we got 
we got some things we can work with here. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm all for your comfort measures. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think volunteering those things up front are very, very loud to a doula and, and a, and a woman who wants a a natural birth. Yeah. And if if it's a natural birth, like as in, we don't have to medicate anybody because there's no reason to do an induction, right? Right. Those usually we have so many options. Like we could even be off the monitor for 40 minutes every hour, which is wonderful. Wonderful. At that point, I'm just like, go live your life, you know, do all the things you need to do. But if we don't, then yes, absolutely. We we're going to, we're going to do whatever works to be comfortable. But if we're on some of those medications that require constant monitoring, that gets a little hairy. We do have the portable monitors, but sometimes they don't work as well. So sometimes they work well, sometimes (laughs) I mean, in my opinion, this is where a doula's training comes into play. I and mean, this is something that I actually teach in my mentorship program and all the doulas that I've mentored is, look, you need to be really good at your job and know how to work with monitors and yeah. being hooked up because mm-hmm. there's definitely a way to work with monitors mm-hmm. yeah. and you need to help. I mean, if that is the case and they're on medication and they're going to need constant monitoring, you need to shift your perspective as a doula. We are now on plan B, right? It is not, it is no longer an all natural birth. That's fine. Now we're on plan B. What are the best ways for me to help my client get comfortable on these monitors? Mm -hmm. And you need to know how to do that and do it well. And there are many options. And so do those things, use them, you know? It's not a wah, wah moment and you don't do anything now because you feel thrown off your game. Mm -hmm. That's not going to help your client at all. Nope. Go to work. It's time to get to work. (laughs) Yeah. Another thing that I think is really important. I like to hear from my patient. I like to hear what my patient wants. And I've had situations, and this is this kind of goes toward like what you're talking about with the dad answering the questions and the that kind of thing. Like whoever's in the room, I I can also tell when the when the mom has had a conversation with me at another moment before anybody else was in the room and said that she's good with all these things. And we've talked about if maybe something on her birth plan wasn't part of hospital policy, what are our other options? And we've all come to the same page, but then other people come into the room and maybe start throwing out their opinions strongly enough that the vibe is mom kind of just does this nodding and Mm -hmm. that situation where you're kind of like, I'm not fully believing that this is what you want, but Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. real. Things are getting weird. I think that probably my weakness is navigating that situation. Yeah, totally. And my answer, uh, first and foremost, is hey, there is a way to avoid all of that. I-, I mentioned this just a second ago in my mentorship program. I am teaching doulas the three very strategic things that I did intentionally so that my clients could have the best natural hospital birth that they possibly could. I did three very strategic things. And one of the things is what we're talking about right now. And the other one is it's, it's all about your mindset and the preparation before you go in and coming in with your Dukes up already is, is actually counterproductive. It doesn't work. And the doulas in my area years ago that had that approach, they're no longer around. They got so frustrated with the system that they're not doing what they love anymore and they're helping no one. Right. I guess that's what I would say is, you know, it may not be going down exactly the way that I would want my personal birth to go. Mm-hmm. So what? Yeah. And it, and it may not be you know, maybe this, this mom has, has fantasized about a home birth in her backyard delivering by the Creek. Yeah. Okay. That's a beautiful thought, a beautiful moment. That can be a beautiful birth, but that is not what you chose. Right. We're here in the hospital now. So we got to lay that one to the side and let's try to have the best experience that we can have here. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's do it unmedicated. Let's do it without interventions. Absolutely. 100%. We got a few things we got to navigate around. I don't have a creek, but I got a shower. Yeah. You know, you can't walk around, you know, around the block or put your feet in the grass. Let's walk the halls. Yeah. I mean, 
we can accomplish a lot of the same goals, but it, it is not going to look the same. And so I think we do our clients a disservice to not prepare them well mentally in a mindset that, yeah, you're going into a hospital room. We can't change that part, right. but you can wear whatever you want to wear. You don't have to wear that hospital gown. <laughs> Are you okay if they cut it in half? If they have to, great. Then wear your own gown. Fine. Bring your wonderful pillow. Are you okay if blood gets on that? Mm -hmm. Fine. Bring your pillow. I don't really care. Make it your own. There are so many things you can do, but there are things that are going to potentially be hurdles. And we don't have to fight through those hurdles. Let's have that conversation and, and let's get through that immediately. And, and, you know, I, I know that there are going to be plenty of people that are listening to this, whether it is an L&D nurse, whether it's a doula or an expecting mom that might really disagree with my approach. And that and that's OK. I, I don't need everybody to like me or want my approach. But I do know for myself and my experience that at the end of the day, the person I want to benefit the most is the laboring mama who is looking to have a positive birth experience. and we're going to figure that out. Yeah. We're, we're going to find a way for her to have that positive birth experience given her circumstances. And that's what I want. And I have pretty much 100% success rate of clients who say I had a positive birth experience and I would do it exactly the same. And they ended up with a C-section. Yeah. And so that to me is more empowering and helping uh, a mom and her perspective and to adjust to be in reality about where she's, where she is and how it's going to go down, but then preparing her for what are her rights. I mean, listen, a patient's rights are right in the lobby of every L and D floor. Yeah. If you want to know what your rights are, go read them. You right. have a lot of rights. And when you know what your rights are before you come in, then you realize there's nothing to fight for. Exactly. I'm, the, the rights you have, you hold all the cards, yeah. period. And so I think that disarms people right away, which is why my clients and I don't go in with our dukes up. Mm -hmm. We know the things that we don't have to fight for. We know what those are. And then we know the things that are going to require conversations and a collaborative effort. Let's, let's do this together. How is this, what's going to work best for mom and baby, you know? And I, I just have found that that is what produces the biggest benefit yeah. to my clients that will be delivering in a hospital setting. So I agree. And I want every doula in the world to take your mentorship program. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, it's an online mentorship that I've just shifted to. It's very rewarding. It's intensive. I love it. And it's, it's a little bit different than what's being offered out there right now in terms of trainings. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I have social media stuff. My doula, my gun, I've streamlined it really well. That's my website. That's everything. So yeah. Reach out. Awesome. Well, Micah, was there anything else that you wanted to add? I don't think I have anything. I think we've covered pretty much everything. And I know we're we kind of covered to the end of so the time. much ground in this episode. I loved it. I love doing it with you. And I appreciate everything that you do, Kelly. I love my LD nurses. And thank you for all that you do. And if you are not feeling appreciated, then know that you got a doula over here in your corner that giving you the thumbs up, high five hugs every day. Thank you. And you have an L&D nurse doing the same to you. Love it. Thank Love you it. so much, Micah. You're welcome. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future episodes. Don't forget to share the podcast with a friend who can benefit from the valuable insights that we share here. And if you could take a moment to leave a five-star rating and review, it would mean the world to me. If you're ready to work one-on-one -on -one with me to embark on a transformational journey towards a confident and empowered hospital birth experience, go to kellyhoff.com backslash empowered and enroll in my Empowered Hospital Birth Coaching Program. Together, we'll create a roadmap to a birth experience that you'll cherish forever. That's K-E-L-L-Y-H-O-F dot com backslash empowered. Let's make your birth experience extraordinary.